Jesus of Nazareth faced imminent death just as he lived his life. With an unswerving commitment to his calling and perfect submission to his Father's will, the road others believed would lead to his earthly glory led instead to abandonment, shame, and crucifixion. Jesus' enemies and followers alike believed it was the end of the line, but it was only the end of the beginning. Join us as we turn to the Gospel of Luke and explore Jesus' final days that led to the cross. As you discover the truth of the real Jesus, you'll find the source of your own story significance. Well, Jim mentioned a moment ago about one of his favorite TV shows, and I know everybody has favorite TV shows. And you know, the truth is, for about as long as TV has been around in America, which I think goes back into the early 50s, people have loved to watch episodes. I mean, you, you get this episode, a TV show that has multiple episodes in a season, then you keep watching it. And a whole lot of us have watched over the years various courtroom dramas because we just love the excitement. Probably some of you are Law & Order fans. Uh, I keep hearing people say, I need to watch Lincoln Lawyer. I'm not convinced. I tried one. Didn't grab me. I'll try it again. Uh, Suits, we've all watched that. So the question is, why do we like those? And I think it's partially because we love to see the prosecuting attorney, the defense attorney face off. It's because we like to see all of the machinations going on among the jury. Like, can anybody be bought? Is there anybody that possibly could come our way? We love to see the accused squirm. We like to see the judge and the final verdict. And that tension and action fills every one of those shows so, that, so much so that some of those are the most popular shows in TV history. Well, today's story from the life of Jesus in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22 and 23, is all about a courtroom drama. There is a tainted jury. There's a corrupt judge. There's a terrible miscarriage of justice. Today, we are looking at Jesus' two trials. There's not just one, but the two trials of Jesus late Thursday night, early Friday morning before he was crucified. And through it all, you can't help but notice how silent Jesus was, just like you see on our title here, silent before his accusers. He seldom spoke. When he was spoken to, his answers were either very quick and quiet and soft, or he was completely quiet. Now, I mentioned two weeks ago in my message that when Jesus read the scriptures, I believe he constantly asked his heavenly father. And when I say scriptures, I mean what we call the Old Testament Jewish scriptures. I think he constantly asked his heavenly father, is this passage about me? Like, is this passage I'm reading about me? Because if it's about me, I want to lean into this and live this out. And I believe one of those passages that Jesus hung on to and realized was absolutely about him comes from a messianic prophecy in Isaiah's uh, book, chapter 53, verse 7. Here it is. Written hundreds of years before Jesus' birth about a servant of Israel that we now we believe is Jesus. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. This prophecy was Jesus' north star during the final 20 hours of his life, starting with that Thursday evening. And I think maybe it will help you, it sure helps me, to get a big bird's eye view of what happened in Jesus' last 20 hours. Because you think, well, this happened and this happened, but I don't really know how it fits together. So let's take a look at how it fits together. The last 20 hours of Jesus' life, starting Thursday evening, message Jim preached about three or four weeks ago. Passover meal in the upper room, and these hours are rough approximations, but roughly 8, 8.30 p.m. after uh, dusk, sun had set, they gathered in the upper room in Jerusalem, and Jesus shared a Passover meal with them. A couple hours later, he takes the disciples. They leave the city. They go down uh, the Kidron Valley, up just a little bit on the Mount of Olives, hang a right into the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prays there, dealing with God's will for his life. By midnight, Judas brings the temple guards. He betrays Jesus. The guards arrest him. 1 a.m. Friday morning, roughly, there was an unofficial hearing at the home of Caiaphas. Caiaphas was a Jewish high priest. It was just Caiaphas and a couple of his buddies. I'll explain more about that in my message in a moment. Just a couple of his buddies. And so this was this unofficial hearing. That lasted for several hours in the midst of it all, maybe four o'clock, maybe several times. There was abuse and mockery of Jesus by the temple guards, the ones that arrested him and brought him back. By 5 a.m., uh, Peter denies Jesus for the third time. He's denied him several times over the few hours by the third time. When the rooster sees the break of dawn, the rooster crows, Peter's denied Jesus three times. By 6 a.m., as soon as it is bright, the trial before the Sanhedrin begins. Um, Pilate, uh, uh, 
Caiaphas invites the other 70 members of the Supreme Court. There's 71. Him, the Chief Justice, and the other 70. They come to his house for the trial. 7 a.m., they take Jesus uh, over to where Pilate, the Roman governor, is for another trial and hopefully a sentencing to death. During that time, there was abuse and mockery, this time not by the uh, Jewish temple guards, but by the Roman guards, who probably were a lot more skilled in inflicting pain. Uh, by 9 a.m., they've hung him on a cross to die between two thieves. It's a six-hour experience. By 3 p.m., he is dead, and he is taken off the cross. And by 4 p.m., he is buried. Why? Because they didn't want to have to deal with this on a Sabbath. Sabbath was 6 p.m. that Friday evening. So before dusk, they had everything done. They wanted to be done. Now, that is a terrible story. That narrative just sickened your stomach, knowing he was the only good man who ever lived, and he was treated mercilessly and dis and. and, and just terribly, despicably. However, Jesus wasn't surprised. He was never surprised. If you've been following in the Gospel of Luke, you know just a few weeks ago, we went through Luke chapter 18, and here are some verses that may not have meant much then, but boy, do they catch our attention now. Taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus said, listen, we're going up to Jerusalem where all the predictions of the prophets concerning me, the Son of Man, will come true. He will be handed over to the Romans. He'll be mocked treated shamefully and spit upon. They'll flog him with a whip, they will kill him, and on the third day, he will rise again. All right. This is what's going on in the last 20 hours of Jesus' life. We are now going to telescope in, to zoom in on one particular aspect of it, these two trials that Jesus was in. The first is what we call the Jewish trial that focused on religious charges. Again, Judas had Jesus arrested around midnight, and the guards took him to the home of Caiaphas, who was the high priest. This was not a formal trial. Um, it was in the middle of the night, which has all sorts of a whiff of illegality in terms of Jewish standard rules of law. It's much more like a grand jury, looking to find out whether he might possibly be accused. So Caiaphas peppers Jesus all night with questions. And whenever he takes a break, the guards come in and they pepper Jesus with questions, but it's a different kind. It's actually a violent version of Blind Man's Bluff. Don't know if you ever played Blind Man's Bluff, but it's a game uh, that kids played forever when I was growing up. And it, you take a person, a group of five or six people, you take somebody, you blindfold them, you put them in the middle, you spin them, and then they're disoriented. And then they have to walk and try to find someone. And you can't move your feet, but you can dodge and move every which way so that they can't touch you, right? You're just laughing at them the whole time. Well, it's a whole lot worse when they do this with Jesus. Check out beginning in verse 63 of chapter 22. The guards in charge of Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and said, prophesy to us, who hit you that time? And they hurled all sorts of terrible insults at him. If you're like me, you're thinking, why in the world would these temple guards beat up Jesus? I mean, he's quiet. He's not making trouble. Why would they beat him up? And the truth is, it's just a pastime for bored soldiers in that day. They were blowing off steam. They didn't have anything better to do. And so they picked on, in a violent way, a defenseless man. Do you remember the old phrase? I don't know if it's Ben Franklin or somebody, but it's in American lore that says, idle hands are a devil's workshop. In other words, when you have nothing to do, <laughs> beware, you could really get in trouble. And that's exactly what these guys did. And Jesus endured it all silently, like a lamb led to slaughter. He was silent. Now, after this unofficial grand jury, at dawn, Caiaphas calls the entire ruling council, the other 70 members of the Sanhedrin, to his home. Because, you see, the Sanhedrin had jurisdiction over all Jewish matters. And this was a religious matter. And so they now are prepared to try Jesus. And here's how it reads in chapter 22, beginning in 66. Jesus was led before this high council, same word for Sanhedrin, and they said, tell us, are you the Messiah? But he replied, if I tell you, you won't believe me. If I ask you a question, you won't answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated in the place of power at God's right hand. Are you the Messiah? They're looking for Jesus to say yes. They want him to say yes, because if he says yes, then that's blasphemy. Because if he does not do the work of God, then he's not the Messiah. The Messiah is someone who's going to bring peace and destroy Rome. If he hasn't done that yet, then he's really not the Messiah. He's faking it. So they say, are you the Messiah? And Jesus is not going to get caught in their little game. And so his response is, well, first off, if I told you, you wouldn't understand. 
If I asked you a question, you wouldn't answer. So let me just use my favorite phrase, because I don't use the word Messiah, because you all never understand what it really means in God's eyes. So let me use my favorite phrase. I'll call myself the Son of Man. You recall in the Luke 18 passage I read just a few moments ago, that's what Jesus said. The Son of Man is going up to Jerusalem. Passage out of Daniel chapter 7, a prophecy about one who is divine. And he said, and this Son of Man, I'm talking about himself, is going to sit where God sits and at the judgment throne of God Almighty. And in essence, he said, I'm going to be judging you boys. You can't judge me. I'm going to be judging you. <laughs> well, as you can guess, that didn't go over well whatsoever. And so here's how they responded. They all shouted, so are you claiming to be the son of God? And he replied, you say that I am. And they said, then why do we need other witnesses? We ourselves heard him say it. I'm curious about Jesus' answer there. You say that I am. I don't remember the first time I was sarcastic, but I think it was about 10 or 11. I got in trouble for talking my whole life, talking too much. But I remember learning sarcasm with my cousin one summer, and I figured out, learning from him, that you can cut people really hard with your words. And my mother had always said, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Well, I figured out you can really hurt people with words, so I got great at sarcasm. It's not a gift. It's a sin. I'm clear on that. But at the time, I thought it was cool. It still stayed with me more than I wanted to. And when I read this, my first thought was, Jesus is being sarcastic. You said it. But I don't think so. I think that's accusing Jesus of something that I'm guilty of. What Jesus is really doing is tacitly admitting that he is indeed the Son of God. But he's really saying, okay, you know, I'm not going to say it. You said it. But more than that, he's going, you know it. You have just spoken a mouthful of truth, even though you can't acknowledge it yourself. And they said, that's it. We got it. When he said, you said it, talking about us, we don't need any more evidence. We can now call him guilty of blasphemy. Now, the Sanhedrin was guided by the book of Leviticus and the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, the Jewish law. And the book of Leviticus says that if anybody blasphemes, saying that they are God, that's blasphemy, I am God, or I'm the son of God, that that was a, pen that was a crime worthy of the penalty of death. The problem is the Sanhedrin could only recommend the death sentence. They couldn't carry out the death sentence. And for that, they needed the Roman governor. And that gets us to the second trial. The Roman trial focused on civil charges because the Jews could not themselves crucify Jesus. They had to have someone else do it for them. Now, thanks to John's gospel, we know exactly where this trial occurred in Jerusalem. Now, read to you a passage from John 19. We're out of Luke, but this is helpful. Pilate... We're going to read about him in a moment, the governor of Judea, the Roman governor, brought Jesus out to them again. Then Pilate sat down on the judgment seat, so he's got kind of a, a throne, on the platform that is called the stone pavement, in Hebrew, Gabata. Um, Jerusalem is the single most destroyed and rebuilt city in the history of the world. It has been destroyed either 19 or 20 times, I can't remember. And every time it's destroyed and rebuilt, it's not like they scrape it. They didn't have big earth movers back then that could scrape everything away. You just built on the rubble. So destroy it, build on the rubble. Destroy it, build on the rubble. Destroy it, build on the rubble. So much of Jerusalem is much higher now elevation-wise than it was when Jesus was there. In fact, when you're in Jerusalem, there's some places where you walk and you think, I'm walking right where Jesus walked. To be technical, you're walking about 20 feet above where Jesus walked because they built it up so many times. But archaeologists have a field day in the Holy Land because they're constantly finding something new. And several years ago, a number of years ago, they found this whole set of stone pavement that they dug up in the old quarter of Jerusalem, uh, the Jewish quarter underneath the city, where they're always doing archaeological discoveries. And this is what they came across. This is what is called Gabata. These are, you see the stone there. And of course, there's no guarantee that that's where Pilate was. However, they also found there a game played by soldiers suggesting that this was indeed a place for a tribunal. And here's a picture of that. Now, this is a scorpion, so that's suggesting like stinging and dying. Uh, I don't, that looks like a, that looks like a first century trivial pursuit. I'm not sure on that. Entertainment, history, sports. I don't know what this is either, but you get the idea that you would place a marker on any one of those things and that you would probably either draw lots or you would roll dice. And perhaps this had to do, the winner got the clothes of the person who was being crucified. Perhaps the winner 
is the person who got to have the last beating, got to be the one who last persecuted and beat up, the person who's going to be crucified. I have no idea, but most people in archaeology believe that this is exactly where this happened for Jesus. Let's pick up with Pilate. Then the entire council took Jesus to Pilate. That's the Sanhedrin, took him over to the Roman governor, and they began to state their case. This man has been leading our people astray by telling them not to pay their taxes to the Roman government and by claiming he is the Messiah, a king. Now, the Sanhedrin know that Pilate could care less about blasphemy as a charge. He has no jurisdiction over blasphemy. That's just a religious deal. So the Jews put a spin on it. They reframe it to where instead of it being blasphemy, uh, they're now making out Jesus to be a rabble rouser. They're making a political issue where he's against taxes and wants to be the new king. In other words, insurrection. Well, Pilate cares about insurrection because he is there in the place of the Roman uh, emperor. And he has to sniff out all people that are trying to overthrow the Roman government. And so he asked the question that is most important to him. Pilate said, are you the king of the Jews? And again, Jesus replies, you've said it. Pilate turned to the leading priest, to the crowd, because there's a crowd beginning to build there with the Sanhedrin. And he said, I find nothing wrong with this man. Now, what is fascinating to me about this entire passage is that Pilate has spent his life in jurisprudence. He has spent his life listening to testimony and trying to do his best to be a law and order judge and to administer justice the best he can. He has sat in judgment over hundreds of trials in Judea. He has sentenced to death dozens of insurrectionists who wanted to overthrow Rome. And now for the first of three times, he says, I've heard everything and Jesus is not guilty. But you also get the sense that not only does Pilate think Jesus isn't guilty, he really wants to get this thing out of his jurisdiction. He does not want to mess with this trial whatsoever. And so he sends Jesus to be tried before Herod Antipas, who's the ruler of Galilee, where Jesus' ministry started. Remember, Herod Antipas has already killed John the Baptist. And so Jesus is now escorted over to be tried before Herod Antipas, according to Luke's gospel. Antipas asks questions, especially, will you please do me a miracle? Jesus doesn't. He sends him back and says, Pilate, I think he is absolutely innocent, just like you think. Well, now the crowd is gathered. It's getting bigger and bigger at Pilate's court. So he gives the second verdict. He said, both Herod and I agree this man is not guilty. He doesn't deserve the death penalty, but I'll tell you what, and I hope this satisfies you. I will flog him, and then he can be freed. Flogging was ugly. A brutal way to punish criminals. A leather whip with thongs, and on the end of each thong, you would have tied either glass or metal or bones, and we can only imagine when that lays across the back and is yanked off, what damage that would do for the rest of your life to your body. The problem is, while Pilate thinks that Jesus is innocent, the crowd's getting rowdy, and he doesn't want to face a Jewish mob. They smell blood. They are not going to be satisfied with anything but death. Let's go. Then a mighty roar arose from the crowd, and with one voice, they shouted, kill him and release Barabbas to us. Who's Barabbas? Barabbas was in prison for taking part in an insurrection in Jerusalem against the government and for murder. Pilate argued with them because he wanted to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Apparently, every spring at Passover, Pilate had to deal with the Jews. You guys respect me, don't have a mob, and I will give you over the prisoner of your choice. In other words, y'all vote. I will give you one get-out-of-jail free card, and whomever you want to get out of jail, I'll let him free. So now he tries to invoke that little power and says, hey, everybody, let's let Jesus go. And they said, no, we want Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a true insurrectionist, which Jesus wasn't. And he was a true murderer, and Jesus was the Prince of Peace. And yet the people were determined to have Barabbas, and for the third time, Pilate says, he's not guilty. But the louder the crowd gets the more Pilate has a loss of nerve. So, with that involved, I want you to see the last passage in our story. But the mob shouted louder and louder, demanding that Jesus be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So, Pilate sent Jesus to die as they demanded. And as they'd requested, he released Barabbas, the man in prison for insurrection and murder, but he turned Jesus over them to them 
to do as they wished. These are the trials of Jesus, a Jewish trial on religious charges, a Roman trial on political charges, civil issues. And while the trials are over, there are ironies that are just staring us in the face. And I just want to highlight these for you. Here's the first irony. Pilate was supposed to represent Roman law and order. He was supposed to represent Roman fairness and justice at its best, but he succumbed to mob rule. And we all know that's cowardice. When I know the right thing to do, and I'm swayed by people who don't want me to, I've become a coward. And Pilate was. Another irony, the Sanhedrin, religious men that represent God, arrested a man. They had no formal charges. They convened in the dead of night, which without a doubt was illegal. And they allowed the judge to be the prosecutor. How can you have a fair trial <laughs> if the prosecuting attorney trying to get you to spill the beans is the judge who's going to vote and adjudicate the whole thing? Well, of course, we know this was injustice. But there's more. The mob asked for a man of violence, Barabbas, to be freed and a man of peace, Jesus, to be killed. Well, that's anarchy because anarchy simply means no law. This is what happened to Jesus late Thursday night, early Friday morning before his crucifixion. And I think as we reflect on these two trials, there's a question that we have to answer. And it's this, who sent Jesus to the cross? Oh, lots of options, lots of people we can point the finger at. But who sent Jesus to the cross? Well, let's start first on the human level. On the human level, Judas was responsible because Jesus betrayed him and handed him over to the Sanhedrin, which makes then the Sanhedrin responsible because they illegally tried Jesus and really got no testimony from him, but just kind of concocted their own answer and then handed him over to Pilate. And of course, the mob was responsible because they were demanding Jesus' crucifixion and they were getting stronger and stronger as only a mob can. Pilate, let's not forget him, he was responsible because he, after saying three times he's not guilty, finally said, whatever, I'm not willing to stand up to you people. And he handed Jesus over to the soldiers. Now, of course, that means the soldiers were responsible and they nailed Jesus to the cross. <laughs> Each one of these individuals or entities deserves and bears responsibility for Jesus' death. They all sent him to the cross. And of course, history has judged them accordingly. Judas, it has not been a super common name for parents to give to their children over the last 2,000 years. <laughs> Jude, absolutely. Because that's Jesus' little brother who wrote a New Testament epistle. But not Judas. Pilate is being remembered in churches all over the world today who are saying the Apostles' Creed. Jesus crucified under Pontius Pilate. The Roman soldiers have been resented as executioners who just followed orders without thinking, much like we consider Nazi guards today who did the unthinkable, and they said, well, we were just doing what we were told. But it was the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin, and the mob that day that had gotten the worst of it. Jews have been vilified for over 2,000 years and called Christ killers, usually by Christians because of their role in Jesus' death. This has often led Christians, this should hurt us to even hear the sentence, this has often led Christians to anti-Semitism and to hate crimes against Jews. And I think you know this, but I might as well say it. That has been, is, and always will be completely evil, vile, sinful, and wrong. Let me say a couple things here. Jews throughout history, are not responsible for Jesus' death. Not specifically responsible. Those specifically responsible, literally responsible, are those who sent Jesus to the cross and those who call for his crucifixion in 30 AD. But you can't say that the Jews for all time bear the weight of just those who are hands-on. And there's a second thing I want to say about this topic. Our attitude and actions to Jews today should be guided by love and respect and kindness. Listen, remember, friends, Jesus was a Jew. Did, did you, y'all remember that, right? Remember he was born a Jew? He lived his whole life as a Jew? He died what? A Jew. He was raised what? A Jew. He is in heaven now after he ascended. I don't think God said, you know what? I think it's time to give that boy a Gentile body. Uh, no. He is the resurrected son of God, Jewish. In the very presence of God, and when he comes back, 
He will still be Jewish. This is just what God did. The first disciples were Jews. The first Christians at Pentecost were Jews. God's covenant with Israel has never been overturned. In fact, take a look at Romans 11, 1 and 2. The apostle Paul writes, I asked then, has God rejected his own people, the nation of Israel? And his answer is, of course not. How could you ever come to that conclusion? No, God has not rejected his own people whom he chose from the very beginning. A lot of people that you and I can point fingers at for who sent Jesus to the cross. But let's never point fingers at Jews as if somehow they are worse than anyone else. We're all guilty. Come into that in a minute. Second level. Second level. Let's go to the divine level. We were just on the human level, but let's go to the divine, to the heavenlies. I think it's fair to say that God was responsible for Jesus going to the cross. If you're thinking, that's weird. Well, the most quoted verse in the Bible is John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his son. Not God so loved the world that he allowed his son to be grabbed and snatched from him against his will. No, it was God's will in love to give his son. And if you're thinking, wow, that makes God a really terrible father. Who would do that to their child? Well, let's keep going. I believe on this divine level that Jesus also was responsible for his own death and going to the cross. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. No one can take my life from me. Judas can't take my life from me. Caiaphas can't take my life from me. The mob can't take my life from me. The soldiers can't take my life from me. Pilate can't take my life from me. Nobody can take my life from me. Why? Because I sacrifice it voluntarily. Jesus was no unwitting victim. Jesus willingly gave himself for us. Now, I've hinted at this, but let's go to one third and final level. And that is the personal level. Because I believe that we were responsible. I believe we were responsible. If you ever want to know what nailed Jesus to the cross, it's my sin. And I'm in good company. Because <laughs> it's your sin. And that's the way it's always been. If Jesus died for our sins, then that means that we helped, spiritually speaking, crucify him. If Jesus died for our sins, then we've all got blood on our hands. And that blood is his blood. So what do we do with the fact that we have blood on our hands? What do we do with the fact that Jesus hanging on the cross is the ultimate sign of his willingness to die for our iniquity, our transgression, our disobedience, our lack of faith and trust, our desire to be our own gods, our willingness to bow down before any idol that makes us feel better? What in the world could wash us clean of that? And the only thing I know to answer is the good news of the gospel. It's stated so many places, but I want to look at something that Simon Peter learned later in his life that he wrote in his first letter. I just love this passage. I hope you will too. Chapter one, Peter says, for you know that it was not with perishable things like silver, gold, moolah, that you were redeemed. Redeemed is a word that means bought back out of slavery. So nobody bought you out of slavery to sin by money. Rather, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Crucifixion language right there. A lamb without blemish or defect, Isaiah 53, led like a lamb to slaughter. He was chosen before the creation of the world. God's always had it in his heart to forgive us. That's his disposition. But was revealed in these last times for your sake. And when I think of that kind of sacrifice and that good news, there's only one thing that that evokes in me, and I believe that it evokes, evokes in you. And that is gratitude and love. John wrote in his letter that we love because he first loved us. That's the only reason we would ever love God is because he first loved us and revealed himself as a sacrificial God filled with love. During this series, um, as we've come now to this final week and these final hours, there's not a lot of things we want to ask you to do. Like, go out and do this. I'm sure there are things that God's Spirit will lead you to do but I don't know what those are, but I do know what I believe we should do today. And I think it is think about this and ask God to fill our hearts with love for Jesus. So let me lead us through a time of prayer now. And I want to ask you to join with me in this prayer and I'll guide your thinking and your thoughts and your holy imagination if you will allow me to. So in this spirit of prayer, first, I just want you, and this is a primary thing, I want you to imagine Jesus, imagine Jesus during this trial, both trials actually. Imagine him being arrested at the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas giving him the betrayal kiss. 
being walked back into the city to the home of Caiaphas where there was a hearing. The early, early morning abuse from the guards. The trial before the Sanhedrin as soon as it was daybreak. The trial before Pilate. The trial before Herod Antipas. The screams of the mob. Crucify him. Crucify him. And if you're honest, can you see your face in that crowd? I can see mine. And I'm confident that I would have simply yelled, crucify him. Crucify him. Watch him as he is silent. And remember that he endures all of this out of love. Love for the big wide world and love for you. Just reflect on that a moment, would you please? Lord Jesus, when we see you in our mind's eye, some of it's repelling, but most of it is inviting. Most of it draws us straight to you. And all we can do with arms spread wide is just to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And that gratitude continues to move until from our hearts we say we love you, we love you, we love you for what you have done for us because of your great love. Our lives are different, and our eternities are different. And so thank you, and we love you. Keep that fresh in our minds today and all week. In your name we pray. Amen.